Several years ago, there was a, a submarine that had been badly battered in combat. So badly that it was rendered inoperable. And uh, the powers that be heard about it and commission a, a group of divers to see how best they could sa uh, save these men before they ran out of oxygen. And as these divers circled the submarine, they, they heard a faint tapping from one of the sailors inside. They listened, they realized that this tap was in Morse code. And they deciphered it mess its message. The message they heard in Morse code was simply, is anybody out there? Help. Is anybody out there? Help. Let's pray. Help me, Lord. Amen. Ever been in a place in your own personal walk with God in which it just felt like you needed to ask the question, is there anybody out there? I know in your head you know it, but have you ever walked through your own valley of the shadow of death where life seems to to be coming at you so fast and you felt so squeezed that you had to look up in the sky and ask God, where are you? I know you are there. Please do something. I know we are taught, many of us, that we are not to question God because it's crossing that line that we, we shouldn't cross. But it, it's difficult at times to live life without asking questions. And, uh, and I believe that there's a certain amount of comfort that is derived if we can believe that there is some purpose to the pain and the chaos that we face. And, and in my questioning, God, it's not like I'm being rebellious or I'm questioning his authority. But I want to know if it, if it is something that I had done inappropriately so that I might not have to go through that experience again. Imagine how puzzled readers of a certain newspaper were when they re re read and had in the lost and found section. They had read the following. Lost my dog has three legs, blind in the left eye, missing a right here, tail broken, and answers to the name Lucky. Sometimes we feel about as lucky when we are struggling, uh, when we are struggling and suffering, to the point where some people believe that God made a when God made the world, he made a mistake in allowing sin and pain to be a part of it. Have you ever felt like the devil was just camping out in your life? Like he had nowhere else he could go? And, and if you're like me, you get to the point where you, you start saying to yourself, if Satan's job is to to tempt the entire world. If that's his job, to tempt the entire world, then he needs to leave me alone and go find somebody else. But if only it were bad people, bad things were happening to. You know, we, we could deal with it. But bad things happen to bad people, and it happens to good people at times. If it was the, the burglar who got his arm and legs broken, we, would, we could deal with that. You know, we, we would probably say, at least I can sleep comfortable tonight. Uh, he won't be going anywhere for a while. Or if it was the murderer who got the cancer, we would probably say, yes, that's some form of justice. And in all that excitement, forgetting that the Bible says you are supposed to pray for your enemies. 
Our text says, all they that live godly shall suffer persecution. Uh, let's, let's look at uh, 1 Peter 4, 12, because Peter expounds a bit more on how Christians should look at persecution. But, uh, It says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. So it's going to happen, he's saying. Don't be surprised when it comes. And, and one of the things I realize is I'm, I'm not sure why when sometimes someone is going through some tough times, Instead of praying why we ought to think that it is because of something wrong that they had done that brought uh, that circumstance on them. I, re I remember once uh, we were having a communion and uh, we went out and after the washing of feet, we got back into the sanctuary where we were about to, to take part in the, the drinking of the wine and the eating of the bread. And we had the bread, and uh, just as we got to go ahead to, to drink the wine, and someone drank it and started coughing. And the church got restless. You could hear the chattering, you could hear the little giggles, and you knew exactly what they were thinking, that somehow this person must have, have partook in this service unworthily. And uh, it took me a long time after that, whenever I took part in the communion service, not to <clears throat> clear my throat <laughs> before I drank the wine. It took me a long time. But let's look at what Peter is saying here. Peter says, do not think it's strange. It's going to come. He begins with the word beloved. It's as if he's about to say something that's not so easily to accept. And he was trying to cushion it so we wouldn't get hurt. And so he uses the word beloved to begin. He says, do not think it's strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you. He says it's going to happen. Don't be surprised. And let me, let me begin with the premise that Sometimes what you're going through is not because you have done anything wrong. Sometimes God will put your pain on display because God knows that it is not what you say about God that moves people. Rather, it is them being allowed to watch you go through whatever it is you're, you're going through. It is them witnessing you, your faith in action, while you stand firm on your Christian principles. Everything you're going through is teaching somebody something about God. In fact, at times it's even teaching you something that you, would, that you otherwise would not have known. Peter says, do not be surprised. And yet still you feel disappointed at times. And it's of little comfort because you read in Luke 11, 9, where it says, seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be open unto you. And if that wasn't enough, you also read where it says, while you're still asking, he will answer. James 1 verse 17 says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of light. Peter says, don't be surprised. Don't let it cause you to lose your faith. 
And let me be absolutely clear, he's not saying you can't cry. He's not saying you can't grieve. Cry, grieve, seek help, call the pastor, call the elders if needs be. But don't let it rattle the foundation of your faith. And one of the things we gotta be careful about is this prosperity theology that many are preaching today. What they're saying is, if you do good over here, then you will get good results over there. Remember Job? Those who support that kind of doctrine must have ripped out the entire book of Job. The brother had one of the most impressive resumes ever. It is a kind where if you were an employer and that resume landed on your desk, you wouldn't even bother to do an interview. You just ask the person, when can they start? His resume read, there is none like him on the earth. Blameless and upright, one who fears God and is trueth evil. Job lost everything, although he had done nothing wrong. There are times when you can dot every highs and cross every T's, and you still get the cancer, still get laid off, still have hard times, still have wayward kids, still can't get enough hours to get a decent paycheck so that you can meet your obligations. But here is the kicker. Let's look at Psalms 73, two to three. Psalm 72, two to three, it says, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. The psalmist says, my feet almost slipped when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So not only do you have folks doing it right over here, but get bad results over there. But what's more troubling is seeing folks who are not even thinking about God. And you see them driving by in their Benz, their Teslas, their petty cash has more account, has more cash in it than you would, could ever work in your lifetime. Meanwhile, I can't even get enough to pay my rent or the mortgage. Not enough to pay the kids' tuition or put enough food on the table. Let me say this to us as a church. We do not serve God because of the benefits package. We do not return our tithes simply because he says in Malachi 3.10, bring ye all the tithes in the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now here it said the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. We do not follow God because of any of that. We follow him because he is worthy and because he first loved us and gave his life a ransom, paying the ultimate price by dying on the cross so that you and I can live. In 1 Peter 4, 13, 
we can turn there, 1 Peter 4, 13. Peter uses the word rejoice. He says, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. He says rejoice. I was okay at the first part when he says, beloved, do not think it's strange. I, I was still trying to get used to that when he says rejoice. I wonder what you think when you hear Peter saying, rejoice. For someone who is suffering, they might say, really? Rejoice? It seems a bit insensitive for someone who is going through something in their life for you to be telling them to rejoice. But suffering is God's way of burning away our sinful tendencies and purifying us as gold tried in the fire. Remember, he said, to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow him. And Christ went through this himself. And he said, if they did this to him, they're going to do it unto you also. So if Christ went through this, then you and I don't get a pass. What Peter is, is doing here, he takes suffering and elevates it. We would probably want suffering to be placed, you know, in the basement with all the other junk. But he elevates it to a higher platform and he says, if you suffer for the right reasons, it is a position of honor. You are suffering with Christ. In verse 15, he says, but let none of you suffer, and that is 1 Peter 3, 1 Peter 4, verses 15. He says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's uh, business. If you notice, he lumps murderer and busybody together. It's because those people are able to do just as much damage to the church of Christ. It is tax time. And if you cheat on your taxes and get caught, that's not the kind of suffering he's talking about. And like in Job, disaster took his fortune. Death touched his family. The book of Job tells us about a man who had everything, then lost everything. But in the end, God's deliverance gave him double for all his trouble. Let this be a reminder that no matter how rough it gets or how tough it gets, no weapon formed against us can prosper. Amen. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. It is a bit sad that Job is remembered, is not remembered for his triumphs, but rather his trials. And there are many out there who are suffering and going through tough times. And that's where you and I come in. And we've got to find a way to reach some of the, uh, most of these folks, if not all, because many are going elsewhere. I, I remember I used to work in the, in the bank many years ago. And I remember a, a customer came in one day and uh, she wanted to put a, a stop payment on a check. And uh, the policy of the bank was, at the time, we can't allow you to just 
get someone's good and service and then come in and put a stop payment on the check. So you have to give a reason why you wanted to do it. And for some reason, she and the teller was just there arguing back and forth. And uh, eventually I got up, took her to the side counter and inquired what was actually going on. And uh, at first she didn't want to say, but what had happened was she went to a psychic and uh, apparently whatever he said was gonna take place didn't happen and she felt like I can't pay him for this kind of service. Whatever he said is not coming to pass. I am just, and, and the thing is too, at the time, if, if my life was right with Christ, I could have easily said to her, you know, I know a man who cannot only tell you what he did in the past, but what is going to happen also in the future. And uh, I'm just so surprised that there are so many of God's people See, going after that which she does not offer. I want to say to us as a church that we need to, to talk more about how good God is, how good he has been to us. We need to be better representative for Christ, encouraging each other, praying for one another, encourage those who have been in the church for many years, Encourage those who have just joined. Encourage those who know the scriptures. Encourage those who can hardly find the text. Encourage those who can sing. And encourage those who, you know. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and not tarry. God does not allow things to happen to us without, and leave us defenseless. He says he will not give us more than we can bear. Let's look at Isaiah 43, 1 to 3. Isaiah 43, 1 to 3. But now thus said the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. He has left us with many of his promises that he will always be with us. And we need to, to as I said before, be better representative to talk more about the goodness of Christ in our lives. I used to watch a lot of, of basketball, and I remember the Lakers and the Sacramento Kings were playing in one of the, the playoffs. It was game five, and the series was tied 2-2. The Lakers were down two points with 0.4 seconds remaining on the clock. And the coach, Phil Jackson, called a timeout, drew up a plan, and when they got back in the game, they inbounded the ball to, to Derek Fisher in the corner, who elevated in the air and let the ball fly. Went straight through the net. 0.4 seconds were on the clock. 
They played the Portland Trail Blazers after that. And they were down by 17 points and rallied in the fourth quarter and won the game. And as I watched this team, I began to realize that whenever they were down, I didn't have to worry. I could say, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a different situation. But they got the, the same coach. And as Christians, when God does some stuff for us, we got to be able to tuck them away close by so that when the tough times come, we can draw on those resources, those experiences. And we too can say, it's just a different situation. But we have got the same coach. His name is Jesus. He's still able. He's still saying to us, do not become weary in well-doing. I am sure if we are going to be honest when we look back through the rearview mirror of our journey with God, we can see where we can now say some years down the line that we are grateful that he, we serve a God who does not always give us what we want, but from time to time give us what we need. Even though we might not have liked some of the experience he allowed, but now we, saw, we can look back and see that it was for our own good. Like Job, as we continue to hold on till he comes, he's gonna reward us also double for all of our trouble. And uh, just imagine he comes back and he, he takes us home and we, to take us home, and, and we are caught up together with, with him in the air. And as we pass through the, the galaxies and the, the many planets, and finally we get to the pearly gates, we're about to enter when one of the angels asks, who are they? Then he who has always stood up for us, the one who John saw walking in the midst of the candlesticks. The one who sat on the white horse and is called faithful and true. He shall declare these are they who have come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In Revelation 5, verse 5, he's still saying, hold on. Do not weep. And, and I, I just want to say to us sometimes, uh, whenever we're feeling down and discouraged, all we need to do is go to the back of the book and see how this thing ends. Devil is not always going to have his way with us. In Revelation 5, verse 5, he's, he's still saying, hold on. Do not weep. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has prevailed. And because he prevailed, we can too. Thank you.